If you're listening to this, chances are that you have a pet, but you may or may not have human children. The topic of having kids is a bit controversial in the pet world especially, and is a very vulnerable topic as well, which is why I never thought I'd be the one sharing my journey to a kid-free life. But today's guest opened up about her own journey to being kid-free, which gave me the courage to do so as well. Whether you have kids or not, there is something thought-provoking in today's episode just for you. Before we begin, I want to introduce you to Rachel Fusaro. She is a professional dog mom and shares tips on how to train and feed your dogs better. I've been following Rachel for as long as I can remember. I don't, since possibly like I got on Facebook, I don't know. <laughs> um, and I really love the safe space that she provides in the incredibly unruly world of social media. And one last thing before we begin, if you take nothing else away from today's episode, I hope it's this. Don't judge another woman for choosing to or choosing not to have children. You don't know what led them to that decision or if that decision was made for them. And please don't look down on someone for giving extra love to their furry family members because sometimes... It's all they have. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So, um, I actually never thought I would talk about this, <laughs> but I know, yeah, you're, you're the first person I've ever, well, not person, but the first time I've been talking about this online. So <laughs> Yeah, it's not something like, like as I was going through the process, I def like I didn't even let my parents or anybody in on it for like years. And it's just not something I ever thought I was going to talk about um, publicly. But you mentioned something in one of your reels about like, yeah. you know, y'all decided that it's just the two of you. And I was like, mm -hmm. This is, this is an issue like that people, this yeah. is something that people are having all the feels about and it could be really important to have the conversation because there are so many different reasons or so many different, I don't know, like avenues and ways people get to this, whether it's a decision or whether it's kind of like been forced upon you. Right. Um, a lot of us are getting here and I have just a couple like quick, I don't know, Big, I think they're, they've been pretty big in like popular culture lately. Like we had Pope Francis not too long ago talking about how it's selfish of people to not have children. And I, it took me, I don't know about you when you heard it. I'm not Catholic, but I still think the Pope has like, he, he has a role in society that whether you're Catholic or not, like People respect him and want to hear what he talk, what he has to say. And I don't know about you, but it was when he, I was, I was, I felt like angry when he first said it. Yeah. Yeah. And I then, think, yeah, well, go ahead. No, no, well, yeah, I kind of, after I went to Italy and then I've been doing some more like research and been hearing different things. Italy is kind of like where this is starting. I think the population decline is starting. So I think he has a different perspective of where the world is going with population decline. So I kind of have a different view of where he's coming from now, but yeah. What were you going to say about it? Yeah. I, I mean, similar, similar feelings. I think um, probably not as strong because this is something people have been telling me for a very long time uh, that 
uh, you know, you'll go to hell if you don't have children because it's in the Bible it says our whole purpose in life is to have children, um, that it's not ethical, that it's selfish. Uh, you know, who am I to not have kids, etc. So I'm used to hearing stuff like that. So, um, you know, I, I've kind of have thick skin when it comes to it, but I definitely had a reaction of, um, I guess, sadness almost like that, you know, the message that that's sending can be really difficult, especially for those who are unable to have children. I mean, that's, that's really, that's really hard to hear. I'm sure. Yeah. I think what, what specifically around the Pope, I only recently learned what really like with the Pope specifically, and this will be the last thing I say about him. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of like, I didn't understand at first because he was specifically talking about people having pets and treating them like their children and how that was not okay, <laughs> basically. And mm. being Pope Francis, I actually recently learned he is the very first Pope in history to take on the name St. Francis. Um, no yeah. other Pope in history has, I guess, felt that they could live up to the standards, the standards of St. Francis, specifically the like caring for the animals part of, of what St. Francis is known for. And mm -hmm. so, so many of us were so like, wow, this is so cool when he, um, when he did become Pope and he did choose that name because we're like, awesome. Like, you know, we're going to get, I don't know, somebody who actually cares about animals. <laughs> so it yeah. was very like, I didn't understand. I think I understand a little bit better now, but um, where he was coming from, because I think we're learning more recently, like now, like within the past six months about population decline. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was just, I, I, I thought it would be really interesting to talk about, because I think even though we're, we were at the same place with not having children. We got here differently. Of course. And maybe in one of our stories, somebody will hear something about them and it'll make, I don't know, make them feel a little bit better or maybe even mm -hmm. change their mind. Um, so would you like to talk about how you got where you are? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I'm excited. Like I said, this is like, exclusive, right? Because I, yeah. I've never, not never, I, I guess, no, I've never talked about this online other than snippets here and there, fun little reels. And I really shared those reels on TikTok, Instagram, et cetera, um, kind of showing a little bit of light on the fact that, you know, we don't have children because it's, you know, for me, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but I think for me, it's not as easy of a decision as I've even maybe let on even to those um, that are physically around me in my real real world, not even just on social media. And I think that's a big um, misunderstanding that um, those of us who are child free or, you know, are sort of deciding in a sense not to have children that we're doing it because we're just blissful about it. Um, for me, it was, it's a very challenging decision. Um, but yeah, I guess let's go back a little bit um, talking about, you know, why my husband and I are child-free by choice. Um, I really have five main reasons, um, which I'll get through. But I guess to kind of start, I think it's interesting that growing up, you know, I was all in tomboy. You know, I loved to play the sports, had a bunch of boys that were friends and stuff. But interestingly, I also loved playing house. I had Barbies. I had, um, I never had dolls, but I had little stuffed animals um, that I would dress up. I had my my cat Tweety that I would dress up and push around in a stroller. Um, but from a young age, I was never interested in having my own family, even though my friends around me, my girlfriends around me was always, oh, I can't wait to grow up and get married and have babies and things like that. And I enjoyed the idea of playing house and I enjoyed the idea of nurturing something. Uh, but I never had this like strong desire at a young age to just have my own baby and and be a true mother. And that really carried into my adulthood. 
everyone told me, and I'm sure you, I'm, you, I'm sure you've heard the same, or those listening have heard this, that you'll change your mind. Uh, like we talked about earlier, you know, it's pretty selfish to not have a kid. Um, what do you hate children? You know, people were very judgmental and very verbal about my thoughts, you know, in my later teens, early twenties, when I would say, yeah, I just don't know if, uh, we're going to have children. And then when I got married, I got married relatively young. I think I was 21. Everyone's like, okay, when are babies coming? When are babies coming? And we were like, nah, you know, that's not on our, 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 um, path, at least for right now. And, um, it was interesting because as I got a little bit older, I'm in my thirties now, as I got older and my husband and I, you know, have spent countless hours talking about this topic, I really realized that it wasn't that I didn't want a family and it wasn't that I didn't want children. It was that, and there's really five reasons, but kind of one of the more overarching ones is that I really knew and felt and believed from an early age that I wouldn't be, and I wasn't a hundred percent confident that I would be able to give another human what I believe they truly and fully deserve to be happy, healthy, fulfilled, and to be a positively contributing person to society. And this was really difficult to swallow and to accept. And so for the longest time, I kind of just played it off. This wasn't something I really talked about or really have ever probably talked about. I really played it off for many years that, oh, we just don't want kids. We love to travel. We are building, you know, businesses. Uh, we were getting our degrees. We were just, you know, very social going out all the time. And I was like, I, I just don't want kids. That's not for me. But you know, for me, it was truly like internally. And this took me, by the way, for those listening that might struggle with hearing that, um, this took me years of introspection, self-reflection, therapy, counseling. And it was hard because when I started talking a little bit about that thought, those closest to me, oh, Rachel, you'd be a great mother. Are you, you're so nurturing to your animals. You're so nurturing to us, your friends and family. You're always looking out for people. Um, you know, you're smart, you're accomplished, whatever you would be, you would be a great, you'd be a great mother. Um, all it takes is love. And again, it really took a lot of self-awareness, um, and truly understanding my limitations as a human being. And I'll talk more about it. Like, I'm not trying to put myself down, but really just being, I'm being really authentic and, and honest here that what I believe that and again, this is coming from a non-parent, so no judgment to anyone, but what I truly believe, um, and maybe it's naive, that a human being needs from, you know, being born or, you know, even at consumption all the way up to adulthood, I don't think that, I didn't really truly believe at a hundred percent level that I would be the person to be able to do that full forward. And to me, and I think everyone agrees with this, like, having a child is the most uh, magnificent, but also colossal and ginormous decision and most significant decision any human being could ever make. Like there's nothing bigger than making the choice of having a child. And I believe, my personal belief that if you're, if you can't sit there and look in the mirror for myself and say, I can do this and I have the tools, I have the experience, I have the mental health, the physical health, everything to be able to give what I believe that child needs at a hundred percent confidence, or at least like 99%. That's not a responsibility that I should be taking on. And there's more reasons than just that. That was just kind of the first one that I was like, okay, like there's something there. Did, have you had any similar feelings to that or thoughts on that? And I can, I'll keep going, but I don't want to just yeah. talk. Oh time. no, no, it's <laughs> totally fine. I, um, <clears throat> it's interesting because as you were saying, like when you were growing up, you never really had that like maternal instinct. And I don't think I did either. I was that person, like literally in all of the pictures you find of me, if I, even if I have a stuffed animal, I mean, I either have like a real cat in my lap or like a stuffed cat in my lap. Mm -hmm. I just like, I was very nurturing like you, but I never, even like into high school, going into college, I never had that like 
internal pull that like, oh, I need to have, I, I want to have a child. I had the, like, I want to, you know, fall in love and get married. I never had yes. the, I yeah. want to have kids. Um, and for a little while, I think I got some pushback from my family, but I, I'm the oldest sibling. So it, it was like, I felt, I felt the pressure initially <laughs> from oh, my for family, sure. but yeah. then I have a younger brother and two younger sisters and my brother is actually the first to have a child. He has three children now. And one of my sisters still to the, she doesn't have any children. She doesn't want children, but my other sister has five. So wow. I feel like my, <laughs> my, your duties my are, mom, <laughs> yeah, my mom at least. And you know, all of our immediate family is like, we're good. <laughs> we have plenty. Like, you know, we're not, they're not seeking more, which is, is nice. Um, but I, yeah. I definitely, I think one of my biggest fears in my twenties, at least where I was just going around saying, I don't, I don't want to have kids. I don't want to have kids. I was terrified of the pain of, and I, this is like, so superficial. I know I get it, but like, that's just me. I am terrified of needles. Like yeah. I, I won't even, I will put off getting a blood draw forever and ever and ever. Like It was yeah. terrifying. For, like the idea of what you would have to go through mm -hmm. to get to, like, I couldn't get past that to see like what it would even be like <laughs> to yeah. actually have a family. And I know that's so like, self-serving. I get that, but it's just the truth. Like I couldn't get past it. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that, I mean, I don't think that's selfish. I think that's self-aware, you know, I think we all have our things that we are and are not comfortable with. And, you know, uh, my husband works in the medical field and they actually, uh, identify or consider now I could get terminology a little wrong, but it's, they actually consider a pregnant person, a pregnant person, um, uh, what's the word? A, a being pregnant is like a disease state in, in terms of what it does to your body. Like it's, you know, it's a pretty serious thing and it, it changes, it changes your body. And I have friends that it has changed them mentally. You know, I have a friend that went through post postpartum depression and anxiety who had never had any of that before. And years later, still struggling with that, um, mm -hmm. tremendously going through many. So that stuff I didn't have exposure to earlier on, but seeing that now it's that fear of the pain or being pregnant, like, Oh my goodness, like nine months of that discomfort. And I have friends who, you know, nauseous the whole time and uncomfortable and everyone will tell you, Oh, it's worth it. You forget about it. And that's fine, but that's a big commitment to put on your body. So I don't think that's selfish. I think it's, I think it's self-aware. Um, yeah. So, you know, kind of moving forward on, on some more of my, uh, you know, my reasonings. Right. Um, so first one we talked about, like, I didn't feel like I could undoubtedly give this human what I truly believe little humans and big humans need. Uh, and in addition to that, I had, you know, quite fairly significant familial trauma growing up. And so I'm sure, and I know, not sure, but I know that that played a big role because for me, even as a young, young, I would say not, maybe not young child, but a young adult would, was able to recognize or, or would question, like if, if I, if I didn't grow up in my most impressionable years in what many would probably call functional, if I didn't see that, like, how am I supposed to go replicate something that is functional? Because probably I don't really even know what that looks right, like, right. And I think that's partly why I feel like I don't know that I could give a human everything they would need because um, I don't, I think my idea of what that would be is probably unrealistic. If, if I'm being honest with myself, like it's like this perfect, and you, there is no such thing as that. And so for me, it's like, instead of putting myself or this little human in that position, it's kind of like, it's, you know, it, it would feel selfish of me to, to go and make that decision um, to have a kid. But I think, I think that's the hardest part of the, my journey to decide not to have children was um, really coming to terms with the fact that it's not an easy decision. And that's probably my biggest takeaway of talking about this and sharing this and like, 
being open to like, you know, when you ask saying, yeah, let's talk about it is because I wish if I could pick one thing that I wish everyone knew about making the decision to be child free is that it is not an easy decision. And I think a lot of people will, even if, even if you were to say, Hey, I've never really had that nurturing desire and I've never really felt, um, this drive to be that it, it, it still doesn't make, in my opinion, in my experience, the decision to not have a child easy because of the societal pressures. And because I think it is biologically in our body to kind of want that at times. Like I've like, it's not, like I said before, it's not that I don't want kids and it's not that I don't want a family. I like, I have struggled being at friends, you know, baby showers and, you know, seeing the pregnancy announcements. I have nothing but true joy for them, but there's a little pang in me. That's like, Hmm, that does look kind of neat. Like, look at, you know, I, like look, you know, seeing my husband and being like, wow, like to see him with our child, like that'd be kind of cool. Or being able to teach our child things that I love or, or show them new things in the world. I still have those pings, but I think my reasons, and I've only talked about two, I guess, so far of, of not having children, like those aren't necessarily easy decisions. Do you feel something similar to that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, and, and I, I think another, I, I, I've definitely felt all of that and I felt it really hard when, and I haven't brought this up yet. My, so my first marriage, I was just like, just comfortable. I was that person that was just comfortable enough. It was like that, you know, that, that analogy of the dog laying on the nail. Like it was not so uncomfortable that I was going to get up and leave. It was, it was unpleasant, but like what, what tipped me to get out of that marriage was that he really wanted to have kids. And I, I mm -hmm. really looked into myself and I was like, I don't want to be connected to this person for the rest of my life. And that was the tipping point for me to get up and, and, and leave. And so I'm in my second marriage now and I love my husband dearly. But he is 23 years older than me. So it was like, I felt really pushed really quickly to make yeah. that like final decision. Yes or no. Mm -hmm. And when his daughter, so he has two children. When his daughter got pregnant for the first time, it was like a shock to my system. I was like, yeah. it's, it, this is his daughter. It's now or never. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so that was like the biggest, like, oh my gosh, I have always been mm -hmm. thrilled for my sister and my brother and everyone around me. And, um, it, it's, I, I don't, it doesn't take anything away from me to, you know, be yes. happy for them. Totally understand all of that. One thing that I, I, was thinking about when you were talking is that it it's kind of a side effect of whether we make the choice or the choice is made for us to not have children. Mm -hmm. It is so much harder to have and maintain friends and yes. be like, I don't know, just social because everyone our age, and I know I'm a little bit older than you, everyone our age is in some stage of parenting, it seems yep. like, and then you just have nothing in common and you drift apart and they're always busy with, you know, play dates and sports and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, Hey, I just want to go have brunch. <laughs> right? right. Like, can we just, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. You say that we, no joke last night, Mikey and I, my husband were, talking about that because we're getting ready to, to make a move to a new city to live closer to my mom. And it's a smaller city. And we're like, man, I hope we're going to be able to make friends. Like, you know, being in my thirties and like, it's, it's harder in general when you're older to make new friends. And, um, we were talking about how most, if not, not all, most of our friends have children and I love them dearly. I'm love being the aunt, like it's the best ever. But to your point, we were talking about how even the friends that we've had, like we're still very close, but it is harder to have that relatability and it's harder 
for us to be able to understand what they're going through and vice versa. So I feel like there is sometimes a little mm -hmm. bit of distance that's created there. So I can absolutely relate to that. It, it's hard. Like, and it, the decision that we've made and the position that we're in or, or anybody who's child free by choice or not is it, at least it feels uh, very uncommon. So then that's more isolating in itself. It is for sure. And, you know, it was, it wasn't until it's, it's funny earlier, you said that everybody's like, Oh, it'll hit one day. Like you'll change your mind one day. Yeah. And I, what I was just saying, I feel like that happened for me when right around, I think it was like, it was happening. And then when my stepdaughter got pregnant for the first time, it hit me mm. hard. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm reevaluating everything. Everything. I'm like, <laughs> it, it literally is now, like now or never, because I'm not getting any younger. My husband yep. certainly isn't getting any younger. And so I was like, I, I felt like that was the moment when I was like, this is it. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do this. We're going to have a, a kid. We're going to have a baby. Wow. And I was in my early thirties. So I felt like I had a few good years, yeah. right? Like we were, I had a few good years. We could get this done and it just didn't happen. And it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't happen. And I felt so defeated. Mm. Like here I am giving up everything I thought about myself like, I thought I didn't want kids. I thought I didn't want to go through this. And then I'm like, no, let's do this. I want to do this. And it's just like, why can't, why, why isn't this happening? Why can't I do this? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's, so then, like, we that's started, devastating. It, well, you know, I, I, I feel like I honestly, I just turned 40 and I feel like I am still grieving. The, this whole thing. So I kind of feel like this talk is a little cathartic <laughs> in a way because I'm still grieving um, what mm -hmm. has happened over the last decade, almost. A decade, yeah. And, um, you know, we, d we, we did, we went to the doctors and I'll talk about that a little more later on. Cause I, I want to hear um, more of your reasonings, but yeah. I will say, and I'm just going to put this out there because I've already established my selfishness. <laughs> Um, I, especially with my husband being significantly older than me, 23 plus years, almost 24 years, I, I started, the more we got into this and the more it wasn't happening and it wasn't happening, I started to get this huge fear that my husband's going to die and I'm, I'm going to be alone. Be alone. Because his kids are grown. They were pretty much grown when we met and it's not like I raised them. Like I love them. They love me all the things, but like, you know, they have yeah. their own mom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I had that huge fear of like, Oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? So I don't know if that's something you ever think about. Like as, as I mean, obviously you and, and Mikey are, are similar ages, but like what it's going to be like, when you get older. Yeah. Well, it's again, um, kismet a bit that you, well, first off, thank you for, for sharing that so far. And I'm, I'm very interested to hear more about that journey. I know it's, I know it's very difficult. Um, and, but it, it's kismet in a sense that you, you bring this up because if I had to choose my biggest fear in life, period, regardless of kids or no kids, it is to be older and alone. And, um, that is a big reason why making this choice, like, you know, you have an interesting uh, and, you know, very uh, challenging and difficult journey to get to where you are today being child-free. But for me, I mean, I, you know, it, for me, it's, um, it's definitely difficult because my number one fear, the thing I fear the most is to be older, and alone. And, um, I think what I've come to terms with and what I've really 
accepted is that kind of no matter what decision anybody makes with kids, without kids, or if we're, even if it's not our decision, whether we have kids or not kids, I believe we're all going to have bits of regret. And I know the right thing to say is that, oh, there's no regrets. Life happens as it happens. But I, I think that even if, and I know that, I mean, at least for the people that I've spoken to that will be very open and honest and say, yeah, there's, they have children. They'll say, yeah, there are tiny bits of I don't know if regret's the right word, but in a sense, regret of like, I don't regret my children, but I, I, there are times I'm like, gosh, like I, I wish I could just live the life I wanted, et cetera. And then, um, a family friend of ours, close friends of, of, of my mom, um, they're in their late seventies and they were child free by choice. And they'll say today, you know, we're happy with the decision we made, but there are definitely times of regret. So I think that no matter which route we go, there's going to be some form of regret. And I've kind of come to peace at that. So for me, other other reasonings, um, the, the idea of, um, you know, mental health is pretty f- and fairly, and cancer actually is fairly prevalent on both sides of our family. So that was kind of, you know, and I, I struggle pretty significantly with anxiety, which I know sounds very cliche, but this is um, something that's, you know, a, I don't really talk about it, but it's something that's just kind of all consuming in many ways. And so when I think about that, the thought of potentially passing, and I'm sure many, much of it is situational, but, or or environmental, the thought of passing that to another human, like I would never ever wish on my worst enemy to pass on or to have, I would never wish on my worst enemy to feel um, the anxiety that I feel when it's at its worst. And so if there's a 1% chance that this could go to another human, like to me, it's just not worth it. Um, you know, I'm high functioning and stuff, but this is, this is years of therapy. Um, and I just, it's, it's been a struggle and I, you know, I don't, I I couldn't imagine that. So that uh, the other, this is a smaller part, but another reason is I, cause we have gone through phases like, okay, maybe we should have kids. And then we both are like, but there's so many kids out there without families. And that that's a very controversial topic because I know that there's a, a joy in having your own. Uh, but that kind of is in my mind. Like there are literally humans out there that, um, you know, they don't have parents for whatever reason or their parents aren't able to take care of them. And then to bring in my own is kind of like, it's, it's a little hard to sit with that. There's no judgment, by the way. Um, I don't know anybody personally who's adopted. They've all had their own and I love them for that. And I, you know, again, zero judgment. It's just kind of personally, it's something I've thought about and has kind of sat with me um, pretty deeply. Again, I don't talk about it a ton because it's, it's controversial. Um, and I think the final reason is, man, I got just, it's, you know, it's tough because I've never talked about this, like, social on social or online. So it's like, I'm trying to be very careful on how I word things because I don't want to hurt feelings or come across judgmental, but I, I do feel like many and no, not to anybody I know personally, but I do feel like many people decide to have children. Cause it's kind of like, well, what's next? And, and the reason I feel that way is from personal experiences of people saying, okay, well, you know, we, we got married and here's my nine to five. And all right, this is the next thing you do. Like, this is going to be what my purpose is. And for me, that never really felt authentic or um, natural to me because I've always been very, I don't know if driven is the right word, but I've had these exciting things and projects and activities that I really wanted to, to focus on. And I didn't, feel like having a family was necessarily my purpose. Um, I don't know. And through that process of like, again, deep reflection and, and thinking about like, why do I want children? And of course, the first things that come to my mind are like, well, little silly is is so silly, but like, I think the idea of naming a kid is so fun. Like I have the most fun with my foster dogs and my pets thinking of names for them. So I think naming a kid would be a blast. I think all the little things that come with it in the beginning would be a blast, you know, the baby showers and like decorating the nursery, like all that I think would be a blast. I think uh, having those moments when the baby's young um, and experiencing those intimate moments with my husband would be incredible. I remember one of my best friends having a baby and I went and spent a lot of time 
both Mikey and I did with her when he was a newborn and we would take night duty and we just took over and did everything as much as we could. And that's, that was the, that was the moment for me that I was like, Oh gosh, I think I want a baby. Cause that stage is just incredible. Um, but through all that, I really found out that like my main like goals, values in life really come down to three things. And for me, it was a decision of, can I accomplish these three things that would get me to ultimate happiness and ultimate fulfillment without having a family? And if I can, based on all the things I said before, I'm probably just not going to have kids. And those three things for me is purpose. And I think these three things are kind of universal for everyone of like, this is what can create a happy, healthy, well-rounded human being. And number one is purpose um, and having that purpose. And like I said before, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't feel like I need um, to have a family to do that. And, and that, that's been like a really obsessive thing for me of like, I, I would say all of my twenties were spent trying everything um, from different jobs to different projects, to different volunteering mission work, everything. Like I just did so much to figure out like what gets me going, what gets me excited, what gives me fulfillment. So I think having purpose is one of, is, one of the three of the most important things for me to have throughout my whole life. I think the other one is um, meaningful connections and unconditional love, which again, a lot of people have told me over and over again, there's nothing deeper. There's, there's no deeper love than that of your child. And there's no, nothing more that gives unconditional love than what you give to your child and, and vice versa. But I'm living and breathing experience that that's not necessarily true, that that's the only way to get those two things. Because for me, again, especially throughout my twenties has been really focused on building these meaningful connections and communities with people, friends and family that we have endless respect for each other that cheer me on and vice versa, no matter what, that are there for me in my darkest times and vice versa. And this sense of like unconditional love, which I feel like as a society, that's not really talked about. Like there's a handful of people in my life that I literally could go make the worst mistake in the world. And I know that they'd be there by my side. There'd be zero judgment and they'd say, okay, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we figure this out? And I think that that is something that's rare. And I think that that's something that, um, a lot of people are missing. And then the final thing for me is health, mental and physical. Like if you don't have your health, you have nothing. And I truly think that um, kind of tying all that together, a little pretty bow is that, it, I guess it falls more into the purpose is I think that the greatest joy and happiness in life for anybody, whether you have kids or not, is by serving others. And I do believe that that's a a reason for many, not all people that have this strong desire to have a family, because there's this desire to not only nurture, but to serve another human being. And what easier way and more convenient and fulfilling way to do that than to have your own baby and then to serve and give and teach and, and help that child through his or her life. And, um, but for me, I've spent so much time figuring out, you know, how can I serve others and, again, like I said multiple times, is I don't think that for me that had to be through the form of having children. Like I believe that serving others is not just in the form of volunteering or paying somebody's uh, bill at the coffee shop. I, to me, it's like one of the biggest ways is being vulnerable like we are right now. And those people that are deep and connected with you, being vulnerable with them to allow them to help you or to put down your wall that maybe you have up or that I have up to allow people in. Um, I think that to me, that's what vulnerable, vulnerability is. Um, and so those are the, those are the things I believe that if I have throughout my life, I'm going to be beyond fulfilled and purpose-driven and happy and content. And that's really more, more my focus is instead of trying to raise my own family or raise my own children. So one of the things that I think is harder to talk about, especially since, I mean, you have just done so much work on yourself <laughs> and figuring <laughs> out, you know, who you are, where you want to be going and what that looks like for you. So is it, how, how does it make you feel 
when, you know, somebody is like, well, you can't just treat your pets like they're your kids or does that make sense? Like mm-hmm. I have feelings about it <laughs> and they're not oh, always yes. the same feelings, but yeah. like, how does how does that make you feel? And I didn't hear anywhere in any of your like reasonings that your, your pets didn't come into this where, and I think a lot of people, especially with, with me, I have the feeling that a lot of people look at me and they're like, well, you just care too much about your pets. So obviously Mm -hmm. that's why you're not having kids or, you know, something around that. That's what I get a lot. And it's very frustrating for me because I don't feel that way. Yeah. But I'm wondering if that's something you get. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Absolutely. Uh, I, I still remember years ago when I, when I worked in corporate, really traditional, surrounded by people who did not see their animals in the same way that I did and do. And I was actually ashamed of and embarrassed. I wouldn't say shame, ashamed. I would say more embarrassed of my passion towards caring for my pets. And I was it was kind of this ongoing joke that Rachel was the the dog person. And if anybody had a question about dogs or wanted to talk about dogs, like they'd go to Rachel um, and people would talk about, I don't know what they're feeding their dog and be like, Oh, and I'd walk in and be like, Oh, you know, I know you, that would be Rachel approved things like that. And Oh, Rachel's not, doesn't have kids. She's the dog lady. And um, so, yeah, I, I definitely have received that a lot. And yeah, you're, you're absolutely right with my pets not really falling in, specifically with those, uh, you know, for my overall purpose and why I believe I'm here on this earth is of course, of course, undoubtedly is to help make this place better for animals and creatures all alike. I mean, I, uh, from five years old up until I went to college, I was telling everybody I was going to be a vegetarian, but what I meant was veterinarian. Um, all, you know, I had my eighth grade or not my eighth grade, my eighth birthday party at the uh, local cat shelter where I asked my friends to bring cat food. And I was, I made the local paper, like literally it was a small shelter. It wasn't this big place. And I would go spend my weekends volunteering there, just playing with cats. And that's all it was were cats. And my mom would drop me off. And, um, and, and when I was younger, she had to stay. But when I got a little older, I could go alone for an hour and I had my friends come and I played with animals. Um, all I ever wanted and all I ever cared about as a kid were animals, learning about animals. Um, Every project I ever did in school was around my animals, even though I remember eighth grade or seventh grade, we had to write a paper. And my teacher was like, Rachel, you can't write about animals. Like you, all you ever do is write about animals. And I did anyways. And I failed that assignment because I was like, that's all I care about. So animals are the core of everything. I think what I've learned though, I think what I've learned though throughout the years is that it's not necessarily the animal itself that I'm so obsessed with. It's that unconditional love that um, I had growing up, but struggled to see with a, you know a lot of things that happened in my childhood. For me, through difficult times, um, which I can talk about in another day, another time in life, the one thing other than my mother incredible human being. Um, other than that, the only real unconditional love I felt growing up and especially in my most impressionable years were that of our pets. They were always there. They were always consistent. I never had to question where they're going to be kind to me, where they're going to be kind to people I love. They were always there. And I think that is why I am who I am today in terms of being so obsessed with the wellness of my pets, because, um, they were my safety net. So I think for me, Pets, yes, hands down, I will give them my everything. Uh, everyone jokes that like, I love my animals more than my husband. And honestly, it's hard, to, it's hard to, you know, not really Mikey, but you know, they, they are my everything. But I think for me through a lot of like self-reflection, I've learned that it's deeper than that. It's that, that what's what they resemble to me. Um, but I think that, um, so my purpose, I believe, is to make this world a better place for them in a way to kind of give back for giving me um, safety and security. I think more than that, and this is something I've been exploring in my 30s, is I feel that I have a little bit of a, it's so hard to admit positive things about ourselves. I don't know why, but I, I feel like I have a little bit of a gift of 
communicating when it comes to things I'm passionate about and building communities, uh, which is why I think I've kind of naturally fell into this social media world to help others feel seen, heard, loved, um, cared about and safe. And that's what I'm, like I said, I'm exploring now. And I think part of my purpose is, is to make these, is to help build these communities. And right now it's, I'm, I'm sharing, you know, tips and tricks around dog training and, and dog nutrition. But for me, it's more than just sharing that. It's taking somebody who cares about this thing so much, their creature, and they want to do so much for that creature and helping them find a path to do that so that they can feel like they're giving their best because I think that will help others have happiness, contentment, purpose. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah your, your social media, it feels like such a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> I try, I try. Thank you. A world of, I was actually just this morning watching a little clip from Jordan Peterson talking about how mm -hmm. Instagram specifically is very detrimental to the feminine. Um, mm -hmm. And, and this is off topic, but like social, social media isn't a safe space. Like that's yeah. not how it's designed. It's for the mm -hmm. average person. You are, it's, you're either going to feel less than Instagram or angry Twitter, right? Like, Twitter. Yeah. The, the, like how these, because the more emotional you are anger and yeah, like well, I mean the, you know, the social media platforms are designed to heighten your emotions. That's how yes. they keep you on, right? Like that's their whole goal is to keep you on their platform so they can then advertise to you. And so it was just, it's really interesting. Like when you actually get into that and look at it and I feel like your page is always a safe space, um, which is re very refreshing. <laughs> um, Thank in, you. <laughs> in the social media world. And I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And it's not that that's the only thing I want to see. Like I, I specifically go to Dr. Judy because I feel like, I don't know, I, I have this different connection where it's like, I love her rants because I feel like that's, that's me. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. just a ranter. <laughs> but um, yes. I very much appreciate the safe space that you create on your pages. Yeah, thank you. For, and, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I feel similarly to you in the, in the whole like nurturing and, and how unconditional the love is that we get from our pets. Um, I ha have not spent time in therapy. I wish I had, I actually, my, my major is in psychology because that's what I intended oh, for um, my life. <laughs> It, it is interesting, the thing. And I, I always, like, I'm always thinking about, like, interesting questions to ask people at the end of interviews and, like, what did you want to be when you were little, which you already told <laughs> told us. But, like, I wanted to be, before Criminal Minds was a thing, I wanted to be a profiler. So, oh, like, Criminal Minds was such a thing for me. So, like, that's why I, I my degrees in psychology with, a, I have a minor in criminal justice. That's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, it didn't work out that way, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I just don't have the like physical capacity. I don't think for it. Like, I don't know the endurance and the, I, I don't know. It's just not me, but, um, I, I feel like with my pets, especially they are my safe space. And that's how I've always felt. And I'm realizing it more and more and more as I'm on this journey to heal myself, because I know I have a lot of childhood trauma and yeah, I'm just trying to be a better, better version of me so that I can be better for the people that I serve and better in my relationships and a better pet parent. And I know that's controversial too. I don't care. I call myself a pet parent. <laughs> I call everybody oh, a pet parent. <laughs> I know. I didn't realize that was sensitive, but yeah, pet parent, pet owner, guardian, like I'm just like dog mom apparently is sensitive. I, I don't do. know. I do. I don't, I, I don't do. pay. I don't pay. Yeah. 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 I, well, I, and for and, me, it's like, there's, I don't know. <laughs> well, and in, in the dog training world specifically, like a lot of dog trainers get angry at the, the parenting word. And it's like, mm. I don't at all. I feel like, mm -mm. I feel like it is my responsibility that, because they provide the safe space for me in my life. 
it's my responsibility to care for them the best way that I know how. And if I want to call myself a, a parent for doing that, then I'm totally okay with that. And I also don't feel like, you know, our dogs should be like obedient little robots. Like they are sentient beings and they have wants and needs. And you know what? They may not be into what I want to work on today and that's okay. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> like finding that balance. It's not all about like, your dog should always do exactly what you say when you say it. I mean, obviously that's important for certain things like in emergency search situations, you want to work on training always, but it's, it's, it's a give and take. And I think that's what a lot of, um, a lot of dog trainers don't see it that way, <laughs> yeah. but it is, it's a give and take. And that's how I approach it. So I don't have a yeah. problem calling people pet parents. Um, I don't think it undermines what human parenting is all about, but that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And honestly, I just, I just don't, if, if, you know, I keep scrolling, if somebody says something, I keep scrolling. It's, it's not really for me worth the effort or time to, to worry too much about it because I, you know, I have empathy, you know, I can imagine somebody might feel by me saying dog mom or parenting that I'm not respecting the dog for who they are, or I'm undermining, as you said, them being a parent, which I'm not, and I know I'm not. So I just move on, but I'm, I'm curious to learn more about your experience. And you mentioned going to the doctor, you know, if you're comfortable yeah. sharing, I, I'd be interested yeah. to, you know, hear of more course. about that. I, yeah, I want to be respectful of your time, but I'm happy to talk about it with you. Um, yeah. So after about a year of trying on our own, and it just wasn't happening, I went to the doctor. And that was a hard decision for me because, as I mentioned earlier, I am not a fan of needles. <laughs> I'm yeah. not really even a huge fan of doctors. I like doing things as naturally as I possibly mm -hmm. can. Now, when I was in my 20s, I was that, like, give me a pill for it and I'm fine. <laughs> I've, yeah. you know, learned and grown and I would much rather do things naturally, not just for my pets, but for myself. I really try to like walk the talk, right? Like, um, so, and, and that's where a lot of my focus is today, but I went and I just start, started all the tests and there were a lot of tests and there was a lot of blood draws and there were a lot of ultrasounds. And after about six months of, I don't even know how many times I had blood drawn and how many tests I had to take and, you know, urine samples and ultrasound, all the things, you know, the fertility specialist was like, I can't find anything wrong. Like, everything mm -hmm. looks like you should be able to get pregnant and you have more eggs than I would have thought for your age. They look good, blah, 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 all the things. So it wasn't even like, well, you're getting old and you know, <laughs> like that's what I was yeah. expecting to hear <laughs> in my, now I'm, I'm like 34, 35 at this point and I'm expecting like, oh, you're too old. It's just, you know, this is how things go when you're this age. But you know, they're like, no, like everything looks great, like better than I would expect. And so I start reading and I start listening to different, you know, podcasts and different doctors talking about it on their platforms and um, other people who have been going through fertility issues. I, I find that's where the most incredible information is. Like, you know, these doctors are great. The books are great. But the, like, I don't know, maybe it's the empathy that comes along with sharing your story and what worked and what didn't work. But, like, I find that's where the best information is, is in just other people yeah. talking about their experiences. And so I, I did all the things. I have drastically improved my diet. Um, we went through the house and removed as much plastic as we possibly could. Like there's just so much. And one of the things I actually, I wasn't sure if I was going to have time, but more recently, I don't know if you listen to Joe Rogan's podcast. 
I think he has like the best podcast. And I mean, obviously I'm not the only one, um, but he had Dr. Shanna Swan on, um, I don't know if it was, it was in 2021 and okay. she was talking about this fertility crisis that we're having. And a lot of it has to do with phthalates, which are, you know, um, chemicals used in yeah. plastics a lot and a lot of other things, but that's like one of the primary places that, and she was talking about how it's like, we can physically, not just internally, but externally with like, I don't want to get too gross, but like the distance of a, a taint is basically what it is and what we call it. Like they're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and like, so we can physically externally measure. And of course, internally where we know, to, know this too, like fertility in both males and females is decreasing in the yeah. world. And so I don't know that I would have even cared about this in my twenties, but I care so much about it now. <laughs> yeah. Um, because not just for me, but like where the world is going. And also I selfishly, yeah. like, this is, I think I'm very much like you in this regard, like everything I learn, I have to put it into perspective with my pets because I'm like, this has to be affecting our pets too. <laughs> for sure. Um, and like the average pet parent may not notice it because we're so into this spay neuter culture. Um, so the average pet parent isn't seeing animals not getting pregnant because I mean, because of infertility, it's because we've spayed and neutered them all. But, um, it, it just makes me wonder, um, like how much is, of these things are affecting our pets too, but I digress. Um, so I got in, into this, like, you know, improving the environment, improving my health, specifically exercising more. And I managed to get my husband to go to the doctor because the fertility doctor that I was seeing was like, well, he needs to go to the, I don't know, special guy doctor. And I don't even know what that's called. Um, I should. <laughs> and it was really, really frustrating for me because it was an older man doctor and my husband came home and he was like, he didn't even get an exam or anything. He just went in and told the doctor what was going on. And the doctor's like, you've had kids, you're fine. And like, that was it. Like, it's mm. not you. Well, okay. You had kids 30 years ago. You think nothing has changed in your body in 30 years. <laughs> so I don't know if like other women out there are experiencing this, but that was incredibly frustrating for me. Yeah. I, I had to really convince him to find a different doctor to go to. And that took time. And he finally did go to a different doctor because he then in his head was like, doctor said, I'm fine. It's not me. Yeah, right. So I'm good. Why yeah. am I going to continue down this path? And I'm like, I've done all the things for two and a half years now. Like we even had gone through, um, it's, uh, we didn't do IVF. We did IU. IUI, I think it is. it's the, or in, in utero, okay. IUF, that's what it is. So we did a couple rounds of IUF, which isn't as invasive as IVF. And um, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work. So I'm like, the, it, the doctor's saying it's not me. I don't know what else. Like, I've done everything I know to do. And, um, he did go to a different doctor and they just did like this regular old, like sperm count test. Yeah. And they're like, yep, everything's good. But I'm over here learning and reading and, and I'm like, th there are more tests to be done with sperm. Um, yeah. it's not just about like, are they moving or are they not moving? <laughs> because yeah. they can actually go in and tell like the viability of sperm outside of the range of just, are they moving or are they not moving? And it finding that we, that never happened, finding a doctor that was even willing to do that. Of course, you know, getting my husband to go find more doctors is, is a Again, challenge. Yeah. Um, but like, that's, it's not a typical test. It's not even something that 
my fertility doctor knew about or entertained. Like I brought this to her and she was like, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard of this. Um, but again, it's because I went out and I searched and I searched and I searched and I was following people who had been going down this path and were sharing their experiences. So um, after a couple more years, uh, I decided, or we decided, um, he decided before me, so it really came down to me deciding that we would look into fostering and adopting mm -hmm. a child. Because obviously that's, you know, as you brought up earlier, there are so many children who need homes. Yeah. And <laughs> we went through all the training. We did all the background che checks. Oh, wow. Like literally we had to submit years worth of like tax filings, all the things. It's like, are you kidding me? Like, how is this required to adopt okay. a child when you, you know, the average person can just like have one and they don't have to do anything. <laughs> to do any of that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so we did all the things and we went through all the training and it was during COVID. So it was all online. And we got to the point where it was like the, the, it was a foster to adopt agency that we were working with. They just stopped contacting us. And I'm like, okay, this is so weird and so random. But eventually I was just like, I guess the universe is telling me that this isn't our path. Yeah. Um, so like I was saying earlier, I feel like I'm still in this grieving process. Um, I was angry at first because I'm like, why would they just stop contacting us? Like, there's nothing wrong. I don't, and I know that's like a, like a catch all term. Like I, I couldn't have foreseen where we would have had any red flags. Right. Um, we have plenty of room and a beautiful big house. Like we have stable incomes. I, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know where yeah. <laughs> things went. It was wrong. almost invalidating, invalidating you in a sense and making you feel like less than almost. Yeah. Is how I think. yeah. Yeah. Well, and I kind of, it may sound silly to some people, but I kind of equate it to like when we adopted our last dog, Kim, I don't know how many adoption, like applic like pre-approval applications at rescues I filled out not a single one of them contacted us back except for the one that we got Kim from. So in my mind, I was like, this is what we're supposed like the universe brought us to Kim. Right. So, um, I, I don't know. I kind of am trying to like put that same thought process in my head. Like the world is just telling me that this is not telling what's you. meant for me. I, f I right. feel like, and I don't know, I don't know where it all ends up. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I try to maintain the best relationships I can with, with the family that I have and my nieces and nephews. And um, it's harder because we're not even in the same state. <laughs> right. But I'm like, I just have to trust that I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. I'm, I'm trying my best to be a good person and put you know, good information and positivity into the world and help other people. And I just have to trust that like things are going to end up the way they're supposed to end up for me and not, not focus on it so much. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's it's again, thank you for sharing that. Cause I know that's has to be hard and I didn't no idea you'd gone through all of that. Um, and it has to be, and it has to be hard because it's almost like you said, you, you went through a phase of like, no, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And then you're like, oh, wait, now I am kind of interested. I'm a little bit older, ready to go. There's nothing wrong with me. Uh, yeah. but now I can't. So it's almost like you went through this crazy roller coaster. So it absolutely makes sense. You'd, you'd still be grieving. I think, um, I think that there's, you know, I think I can re relate on certain levels in that I feel like, um, you know, I have moments of grieving as well, especially as I'm getting in my older thirties. Cause it's at this point, 
you know, it's, it'd be pretty unhealthy, not unhealthy. Um, you know, as you get older, right, there can be more complications and things. So it's, it's kind of what you mentioned before that, like, kind of last opportunity um, to have, like, you know, and, and, you know, I do want, what, what if one, what if at 46, I'm like, all I ever want is a kid. This has all been a lie. Like, oh my gosh, you know, like those still come in my mind. And hence why I've spent so much time, like really trying to dig deep so that I hopefully wouldn't get to that point. Although we can never know the future. Um, but I can relate in a different way, but slightly to the sense of grieving because it is, and it, it's hard because it's in your face 20, it's everything, right? It's, in the movies, it's in the TV shows, it's in real life, it's at the grocery store, it's with your family and friends, it's on obviously social media. It's like, you can't escape seeing these happy families or these happy people with children and the cute photos and this and that. And even if you don't like kids, it's still hard to see that and not go, that's kind of sweet. That is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I can get that. Yeah, and it, it's hard to have those feelings of like missing out on yes on something that you know nothing about really <laughs> yes <laughs> um, and I, I will say like I also find it difficult sometimes to talk specifically in when it comes to pets and children um, mm. like I I have certain people in my head like that have said things to me in the past. It's like, you're not a parent, so you're not qualified to, you know, talk know. anything about parenting. And that's always like in my head. And I'm like, but I still have common sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I may not be a parent to a human child, but I still have common sense and understand how like interaction should go. And um, I don't know that, that it is scary. Like, it's scary thinking about being a parent and it's scary thinking about not being a parent. So it's, it's all like, where do you, I don't know, which yeah, side that, are you going to fall yeah. on? That's a really, that's like, that could sum up everything. It's scary <laughs> to think about being a parent. And it's also scary to think about not being a parent. And like, I wish that in itself was more talked about because I feel, and I noticed this before, but like, if there was one takeaway, at least for me selfishly that people would get is that, Obviously, if you want children and you can't have them, that's incredibly impossible. I could never understand that pain and very, very challenging. Choosing not to have a child is definitely not the same, but it's still, at least for me personally, still very difficult. And it's hard, you know, I, I don't even have anything I could compare it to, but, you know, it's, it's a hard, um, it's a hard pill to swallow. I think what makes it easier for me is like my husband, Mikey, we're just really on the same page about it. And we've definitely had fluctuating, like maybe we should, you know, so, you know, there's been times he's, he's been, he's actually had a vasectomy at this point. Um, but there's definitely been times before that it was like, Hmm, should we? And I'd be like, what heck no, or vice versa. But I think what's really helped us is like, we have talked about the concept, um, the concept <laughs> we've talked about having children and not having children to obsessive amount levels, like at great details. And I think that's actually probably the final reason. I don't know if I mentioned of like, for me of making that decision that I probably didn't think about until a little bit later in life after being married for a little while is that, and I don't say this in a, uh, in a way to show off or brag, but like, my marriage and my relationship to Mikey is like so profound. I know I've hit the jackpot. Like, I don't know how I looked out. Um, we just jive and I feel so blessed that like there was like, as I started to really appreciate what I had as, as we got more years in our marriage, I started thinking I cannot jeopardize. Like I will do nothing. I will obsessively make sure that I'm doing everything I can to make, help our marriage stay strong and, you know, at least growing up and a lot of people around me, you know, it's kind of this, you have kids and then you're not able to make it. And I'm not blaming children. I know there's a lot of other factors. I'm just saying like, that was like, you know, the sixth reason on my list of reasons or whatever of like, yep, I, you know what? It's not worth, like I would, I would, I would 100% pick what Mikey and I have 
for the rest of my life than a 1% risk of doing something that might jeopardize that. So that's kind of my other thing too. That makes a lot of sense because children do change the dynamic in a relationship. I mean, they, they mm-hmm. have to like, because yeah. you go from the two of you loving each other so much, you don't know what else to do. Right. <laughs> and then yeah. each of you loving this being more than the other. It's yeah. you know, like, that's natural. That's what that's, that's what's supposed to happen. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And that's I right. can't, I really can't thank you enough enough for like yeah. even agreeing to have this conversation. Um, I think it's important for people, especially those of us who, you know, I, you said it, it it's a, exactly the same thing that happened to me where like when I was working in an office, everybody was just, oh, you're the crazy cat lady. Like we, you know, I, yeah. I found a cat. Here you go. Like this is, that was my life. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, so going from like, that's all people think of you as like, oh, you're the, you're the crazy cat lady or the crazy dog lady, or like, it, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard for people to see you and not like categorize you that way, <laughs> if that makes yes. sense. And it really does. We're so multifaceted that. Um, I had no idea the amount of work you had put into the, that, the decision that you and your husband have made. And just like you didn't know, like what, what my husband and I have been through and it changes the relationship too. Like for you and Mikey, fortunately, it sounds like you have an even stronger relationship because you have put all of this work in and you've come to the same conclusion and you support each other unconditionally in that decision. And, you know, in, in my situation, I think at least for me, I I always struggle with like the animosity towards my husband sometimes because it's like, well, the doctor said it's not my fault. (laughs) Yeah. So you're the broken one. Everything's wrong with you. (laughs) Which, in, I mean, obviously, is I can't say that with any degree of, of certainty because of course. who the heck knows? Like, it could, in fact, 100% be me because of factors that I maybe even had no control over growing up and the, the sure. you know, environmental factors and just where our, um, where humanity is going, um, which is interesting because when I was in my 20s, I believed the narrative that we were overpopulating the earth. And now that I have done more research and I have opened my mind up and I have learned more things, I realize that it's actually the opposite. And it's so, it's so interesting when, when you open your mind up to these new ideas and new possibilities, literally as we were hopping on this call, I got a notification on my phone that, like a news notification that for the first time in decades, China reported a population loss last year. So like, it's, it's not, it's, it's, I think it's just one more thing to say, like, it's not this like selfish decision. It's not, I don't want people to look at someone without children and just say, Oh, you're selfish. Not even knowing what they've been through to get to that point. Like, we don't know what everybody has been through. And yeah, maybe some people are out there who are just like, I don't want to ruin my life with a child. Like, I'm sure there are people out there like that. And that's fine, but that's not all of us. And I don't think, I think that what I really wanted to get across to anybody is like pouring that love into your pets, I don't think is wrong. Of course not. Even if you have children. There's, yeah. I believe I'm obviously not a human mother, but I believe you can even do both, you know, for those that have children, um, I have a lot of followers that, um, have grown children too. And they're kind of feeling this like sense of emptiness and they're taking that and putting that into their pets. And I love, I love that for them. That's awesome. Yeah. I just, I think our pets can fill holes in our lives that we know are there and that we don't know are Thank there. You. Um, and I, I, I just don't think there's anything 
wrong with that. I think the human experience is individual to all of us. And, you know, we just have to get through it the best way we can. <laughs> and if our pets can help us do that, then do it right. Like if, if you're providing a healthy, safe space for that pet, <laughs> then, you know, love on them and let them, let them fill the holes in you that whether you know they're there or not, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more for sure. I think that, you know, because if, if you as an individual or if I as an individual am not whole, not fulfilled, don't have purpose, don't have happiness, um, how can I serve or give to others, whether that would be a child or a friend or a neighbor, it's very difficult to, I imagine. And so if part of the way that you get there is through serving your pet and caring for your pet, I think it's a tremendous way to do that. So I'm of course believe that. <laughs> well, I mean, really, thank you so, so much for opening up and being vulnerable. I appreciate it. And I know our listeners appreciate it because it isn't an easy thing to talk about. Um, so to kind of, um, I don't know, bring things up just a little bit before we end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, has there, has there been anything that you have like read lately, listened to watch lately that is just like incredible pet related or not, doesn't matter that you're like, Hey, go check this out. <laughs> um, I would have to say, <sighs> Gosh, there's so much. I'm trying to think what would be most relevant. I mean, I'm sure you've talked about it. I, you know, I had to plug the forever dog. I think I'm doing kind of chapter reviews on that right now. And I think that's just uh, phenomenal. And I think really important for pet parents to read. Um, and I've been kind of going through every chapter and kind of summarizing my thoughts on it. And I think uh, that's a really, a really good place. Um, kind of not pet related. And I don't think most people watching, listening to this will probably, even my audience included would love this, but my, um, another passion of mine is around marketing, um, creating, creating content in general, uh, in, in kind of the world that I'm in as a full-time content creator. And my favorite person to follow is Gary Vaynerchuk. And so I always say anybody who's kind of likes to hear things directly um, about life and about happiness and fulfillment and about building a business, whether that's like a social media platform or just a small business. I, uh, you know, I started listening to him um, and a lot of people, he's very vulgar at times. So a lot of people don't like him, but um, I started listening to him back in like 20, I don't know, 16, maybe like for many years. And like, I can undoubtedly say that like in terms of my content, social media presence, where I am today, um, a big chunk of that is, is to him and, and what he's shared. And I really like that kind of like no fluff, no BS, like advice for life and business. So anyways, that's, that's kind of the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah. I, um, my husband and I both love Gary Vaynerchuk. He's really, okay. I, I'm always <laughs> hesitant. Nine times out of 10 people either don't know who he is or they think I'm just a disgusting human for following him. Like, Oh, he's like, yeah. I've been following him since the wine library days and before he was kind of who he is right now. And so watching him evolve has been really inspiring for me, but I, I truly think if I truly think I'll say 80% of the population, if they were to kind of watch him and if 80% of the people that want to build an online presence and or small business and or self-development were to watch him, will receive some kind of life changing, um, guidance or advice. It's my belief. That's awesome. Absolutely. I think even if you're not trying to build a business, like he just has some really practical, like yeah. get your shit together kind of yeah. thoughts. <laughs> right. I know. I know. I love it. And I love that you guys follow him. Cause like, we're, we're definitely probably not his demographic you know, from people who follow him. I feel like it's kind of like business no. bros and stuff. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I, I totally get that. Like I'm, I'm really into Mel Robbins lately and yes, um, she just uh, came out with a new limited series on audible that I'm, I'm listening to. I'm loving it. It's called um, reinvent your life. I think is what it's called, but okay. it's, I, I love it because I'm all into like self-help and <laughs> 
the, yeah. the whole film genre. And um, yeah, I, I, oh, my, my dog walker's back with my Kimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, so awesome. I, again, yeah. can't thank you enough. Those are some awesome recommendations as well. And I, I hope that, I hope that something in one of our stories can resonate with uh, the people listening to this, whether, even if you have children, like, because you said, like you said, like at the, at the end, is it, I don't know, maybe are there regrets? Like, you know, maybe it can just help somebody to reframe the way they're thinking or, or even maybe even appreciate their kids more <laughs> because yeah. I think we can get really caught up in the, uh, of everyday life. <laughs> For sure. Um, so thank you so much. And where I, I mean, obviously I follow you, but where can other people follow you so they can get more incredible self love and safe space content? <laughs> uh, I love that. Um, it's just my name, Rachel Fasaro on every platform. YouTube's YouTube, uh, um, is probably my largest platform. But on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, I post every single day. Uh, I share uh, training and dog nutrition and enrichment tips and tricks uh, every single day. So, and then you can even, my website is just rachelfasaro.com. So if you know my name, you can find me. Awesome. I need to see a little bit more Haven. <laughs> I, get, I do get, I do get that a lot. My, my, 18 year old cat who was my first, my first pet outside, like after leaving home, uh, and has been with me since she was about a year. They said that the, the shelter says she was probably about a year old. And it's funny, everybody, it's funny you say that because everyone thinks I'm a crazy dog mom, but, uh, ask anybody in my close circle and they know that she's my favorite by far. Um, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I just don't know why I don't post her as much, I guess. <laughs> It's okay. It's harder. I will say I, I, I definitely started out with cat content and I wasn't getting anywhere. And when I switched to dog content is when I st finally started to see like a little bit of, so I, I, I get that. It's like, it's so much yeah. harder to, I don't know, get anywhere with the cat content. Yeah. Yeah. But so anyway, definitely go follow Rachel. Thank you so much again. And it was just such, sure. such a pleasure to meet you and chat with you and, hear a little bit more about your story. And, um, now we do know each other. <laughs> yes. I'm very, I'm very excited. And I thank you for the opportunity of being here. It, it means a lot to have this space, safe space, uh, to share this. And I feel good. Like, I feel like you said, cathartic, like it's good to kind of open up and talk about this more and we should do it again. Maybe talk about marriage or something. I, th that's kind of my, like maybe 10 years from now, um, people are like, oh, what's next in terms of like, I, um, I do want to do a podcast, but, uh, around animals, but one day maybe talking about relationships and more of this stuff, because it is, I don't know, it's very interesting. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode and please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.